Next, the economic and political struggles in Tunisia one year after the revolution that sparked the Arab Spring. Our story is part of a collaboration with the Pulitzer Center on Crisis Reporting. The reporter is Jesse Dieter, an independent producer and director who's worked in Africa and the Middle East for more than a decade. For these demonstrators in front of the building that now houses an elected parliament, it was jobs and economics that brought them into the streets. Unemployment was 13 percent when the revolution began and has soared to 19 percent a year later. Here I am, still selling these rags. I mean, I haven't gained from it any work, nor a bite of food. Unemployment is something unbelievable right now in Tunisia. For the youth right now, they want to cause trouble in this country. They're not happy that a year has passed with no results. Tunisia's revolution coincided with the debt crisis in Europe and a generally sluggish world economy. Additionally, according to Tunisia Live News founder Ziad Mehersi, Tunisia's tourism is in a deep recession. For the second year now, we're having a, a serious decrease in the number of tourists coming to Tunisia. The number dropped from 7 million people a year to 3 million people a year. Tourism is really paying a high price during this revolution. The government has a lot on its plate. Not only a struggling economy, but all the rest of the problems involved in establishing a fledgling democracy. Sana Wushteri is a law professor and member of an opposition party. I believe that even if it's difficult to expect results that are immediate and sustainable, you must present to the people who have been waiting for one year for something concrete and tangible right away. The parliament is dominated by Nahada, Tunisia's mainstream Islamic party. It swept October elections with 41 percent of the vote. Human rights activist Intisar Hariji is a Nahada party member who returned to Tunisia after 20 years in exile in London. She counsels patients with a government that has been in power less than two months. I think what's important is that you have people in government who are serious about reform, and they're there to, to, you know, to make change. They're not there to steal, they're there to build. Just as, you know, if you look at history, the, um, the American democratic system, the American Revolution, took a while to, to transform into a stable democratic system. Members of the new constituent assembly are meeting here at the parliament building to help define the rules that are going to change and shape a new Tunisia. But assembly members are getting hung up on logistical issues, like which language should be allowed in session. A handful of members are Tunisians who have returned from living abroad and don't speak the standard Arabic many consider correct for parliamentary meetings. Our original language, there isn't a difference. We are all serving the Tunisian people. I swear on Allah's name, please let me continue. Jahora Atis is a member of the Constituent Assembly who's growing used to working late nights in the parliament. What's agreed upon by the different people is that we have to use the Arabic language because it is an official, uh, the official language of Tunisia. We did not reach, a, let's say, a consensus. Then the, uh, we'll, uh, this is will delay to, uh, till tomorrow. Citing the Turkish model, Nahda spokesmen have clearly stated the party's intention of establishing a sustainable democracy protective of minority rights. But conservative Islamic groups strike fear in the hearts of more secular Tunisians. Hayat Bouguera is a civil engineer and blogger. These young people, Tunisians, real Tunisians, couples that stroll along the beach, and even the veiled ones, even the women in hijabs, they're in couples too, and it isn't a problem. People like Bouguera worry that Nahada is not standing up strongly enough to more hardline religious factions. They're letting the Salafis do whatever they want so that they look moderate. They're doing this so that the world accepts Nahada. So accept us, we're democratic, we're not like them. But Nahada party leaders have said that the new assembly will not introduce Sharia law or other Islamic concepts to the new constitution. Intisar Hariji, 
daughter of Nahada party leader Rashid Khanoushi, defends her party's stance toward women. She says that the fact that Nahada has 42 female representatives in the parliament speaks of its intention to help women succeed in the public as well as the private domain. I think you can take a look at the Nahada women in the assembly uh, and see the kind of work they do. Many of them are professors, many of them are lawyers, many of them are doctors. They are entirely representative uh, of the Nahada uh, mainstream. All my three sisters are doing PhDs and there's been always a, uh, a spirit of education within our household because without education you can't build a, a democratic society. Jahara Atis is an English teacher and Nahada party member who had to quit her teaching job when she was elected as a member of the assembly last fall. She says that women are valuable contributors to assembly sessions. All of them are strong and all of them are, are, uh, 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 are intelligent and all of them are enthusiastic about this experience and they want to, 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 to be voiced by themselves and not to be voiced through the male voice. Tunisians are deep in the process of discovering what it means to govern themselves. They have much to celebrate as they have undergone a transition that is by and large peaceful, if also somewhat messy and painful. Several people we talk to, even with their worries, insist their country will be better off than the repression that came before. Suhail Bentashima recently returned from Russia, where he studied engineering to start a plastics company in Tunisia. I came back to participate in the revolution, to build my country, because I think like everyone here, every Tunisian citizen is responsible to, to improve the, the economy. And I think what happened with the Tunisian revolution is that it gave people the belief that actually these governments are not as omnipotent as we thought they are. And I think Tunisia, given its position, given its resources, and given its people, I think has a real shot at building a real democratic society. I feel that um, in three or four years, which is a really a short amount of time, we're going to see a totally different Tunisia. We're going to see a new generation in power. Uh, we're going to see that uh, um, Tunisia is going to be more open to the rest of the world. Although I can feel that there are a lot of challenges ahead, I have no doubt that the future is much better than the past. But Tunisians are still waiting for answers to their immediate and urgent economic problems for Parliament to create a real constitution that guarantees civil rights for all, and the political struggles are bound to continue through the next elections a year from now. You can find Jesse Dieter's impressions of post-revolution Tunisia in her blogs on the Pulitzer Center's Crisis Reporting webpage. You can find a link to their site on ours.